Hi everyone, my name is Amber, welcome back to my channel, welcome back to my true crime video series. So I'm a booktuber, but earlier on this year I started to incorporate my fascination with true crime into my YouTube videos. I've only done one video so far because I posted my first one, which did receive very good responses. People seemed to enjoy it and people discovered my channel that way, but then I got a bit scared and didn't really want to do any more. And also these true crime videos take a lot of research, so I don't really know how people do this every single week because there's a lot, especially when I'm also reading other books in order to do my normal bookish content. But anyway, I am back with a second video and I have at least three more planned. So I'm hoping not to take as long of a break this time because I really appreciated the reception that my previous video got and I love that you guys enjoyed the idea. So basically what I do with this series or will be doing in the future is I will be looking at a true crime case and I will also be reading a book or several books that are to do with the case and then I will be telling you about the case beforehand first of all and then later on I'll be talking about the books and how well I think the books delivered the information, whether I, or not I think they're worth reading, whether they were useful to me in my kind of investigation <laughs> into the case if you want to call it that. Without further ado, let's get into the video. The case that I'm going to be talking about today is the murders of the Bamba family at White House Farm in Essex, England. And the book that I used for most of my research was The White House Farm Murders, sorry no, The Murders at White House Farm, Jeremy Bamba and the Killing of His Family. So I believe this book came out before the Netflix TV show but it has been turned also into a TV show on Netflix. I've only watched the first episode of that so I can't really comment on it, I'm mostly going to be talking about the book and my research while reading it. So starting off we have Neville Bamba and his wife June who were both born in 1924 in the UK. The book does go into a bit of background about them but the main thing that you guys need to know is that they were married in 1949 and both of them were very popular within their local community. They owned a farm called White House Farm in Essex, England which sat on 300 acres of land. I don't know how much 300 acres is but it sounds like a lot and it definitely made the Bamba family a very rich one. Neville and June often invited family members and friends to stay at the farm with them. They were always inviting guests over to either stay for a week and kind of chill out or just the evening for a nice dinner. June in particular was also very heavily involved in her local church because she was very heavily religious and we'll talk about this more later on because it is said to have affected her relationships with her family members. So like I said the couple married in 1949 and unfortunately they were unable to conceive children naturally. This is said to have made June very depressed and she was admitted to hospital in the 1950s and she received electroshock therapy. After years of trying to conceive naturally because I think that was probably their preference, June and Neville turned to their church to adopt a child. In 1957 they were able to adopt a little girl called Sheila through the Church of England Children's Society. Sheila was actually born to a very young mother and that's why she was given up for adoption. A few years later in 1961 Neville and June adopted again, this time they adopted a little boy that they called Jeremy. Jeremy's biological mother was the daughter of a vicar who had been having an affair with another man and so it's thought that's why Jeremy was given up for adoption in the first place. So growing up Sheila and Jeremy Jeremy may not have had the closest relationship with their parents. I know that they were sent off to boarding school quite early on. I think that considering that June and Neville Bamber were very involved with their community, sending their kids off to boarding school was a strange decision on their part because I feel like it would have isolated Sheila and Jeremy from their community. So when she was 17, Sheila fell pregnant with her boyfriend's baby. The boyfriend's name was Colin. She did end up having an abortion and it is thought that June was actually the one to heavily encourage this. After the abortion, Sheila spent some time at home at the farm to recover. June was very unhappy when she found Sheila and Colin together again, so she tried to put an end to the relationship, although it didn't really work. Sheila then tried to pursue a career in modelling, and she again fell pregnant with Colin's baby. This time she married Colin to kind of cement their relationship, I suppose, and perhaps to appease her parents. Unfortunately, this second pregnancy ended in a miscarriage, and I think she had at least one more after that. But eventually Sheila gave birth to twins, called Nicholas and Daniel. I'm not sure when it started, but at some point Colin started to have affairs, multiple, and this led to the couple getting a divorce in 1982 after just five years of marriage. This kind of rough start caused Sheila's mental health to decline, understandably I think, and she even tried to seek out her biological mother who was living in Canada at the time and she didn't really want anything to do with her, so I think Sheila may have felt worse and worse about herself after that. Thankfully she was able to speak to a psychiatrist who admitted her to a psychiatric facility where she was diagnosed with 
schizoaffective disorder. Now I don't know how accurate that diagnosis is because obviously this was the 80s and mental health diagnoses weren't the most accurate then. It feels like everyone was being diagnosed with schizophrenia. Make of that what you will. Jeremy, on the other hand, after finishing school, spent a lot of time travelling around Australia and New Zealand. Apparently that's where he got involved in some drug dealing pursuits. I don't really know much about the drug dealing world but that's what we'll call them. And after a few months, he returned to the UK. It is said that Neville was trying to get Jeremy to help out a bit more around the farm once he had returned from Australia and New Zealand, because I don't think Jeremy was able to hold down any other job. He was kind of living off his parents' money. So that was a bit of background on the family. I think it's clear that the parents had a very strained relationship with their children for various reasons, who even knows. And while they did perhaps have close relationships with their employees, friends, and other family members, Neville and June's relationship with their son and daughter was not the best. So on the 4th of August in 1985, Colin, who at this point was divorced from Sheila, drove Sheila and their two children to White House Farm. The plan was for Sheila and the boys to stay over for a week while the kids were off school. Colin's plan was just to drop them off and then leave and then come back later to pick them up. Apparently the two boys, Nicholas and Daniel, weren't too keen on staying with their grandparents, particularly with June, because she often made them pray before bed and during meals, and they weren't very keen on that. So Colin said that he would have a word with her and Sheila also allegedly allegedly asked Colin to have a word with her mother about June's treatment of Sheila. So while he was dropping the family off, Colin did speak to June about not making the boys pray but he didn't mention Sheila at all and apparently Sheila was a bit upset by this because she didn't feel supported by her ex-husband. So Sheila and the boys spent a couple of days at the farm and then on the 6th of August Jeremy showed up for dinner. He stayed for most of the evening and he was seen leaving the farm at 9.30pm. These next two facts are quite important for the timeline of events so I'm just going to quickly mention a couple of people who called the farm. The farm's secretary Barbara called to talk to Neville around 9.30 and she said that it sounded like she had interrupted an argument. I couldn't find any more information than that, so we could assume that someone in the family was arguing, maybe Neville sounded quite frustrated on the phone or perhaps angry, it's not very clear. At about 10pm, June's sister Pamela phoned up and she was able to speak to both Sheila and June. Apparently, according to Pamela, Sheila was quite quiet, which wasn't necessarily unusual for her, but was perhaps a bit odd. I don't know if perhaps Pamela had a better relationship with Sheila and was expecting more of a conversation and Pamela also said that June seemed quite normal. And then that was the last time that anyone had heard from any of the Bambas except Jeremy. So in the early hours of the following morning, the local police department received a phone call from Jeremy Bamba. He told the officer who had answered that he, Jeremy, had received a call from his father, Neville, who had said that his sister had gone berserk with a gun. The officer who answered the phone took this quite seriously and so he sent three other officers over to the farmhouse after receiving this call. Apparently these three officers passed Jeremy on the road on their way up to the farm and they ended up arriving at the farmhouse before Jeremy did, which is a bit weird because if his sister is going crazy with a gun and presumably threatening at least to shoot his family would he not have been speeding up that road so eventually jeremy also arrived at the farm and everyone was waiting outside together because they needed a firearms unit here in the uk the normal police aren't equipped to deal with someone who's wielding a weapon. Our everyday officers don't have guns and so we have a special firearms unit for that. Apparently once the firearms unit arrived they and the other officers attempted to contact Sheila who was supposedly inside the house for two hours and there was complete silence. No one was answering. Sheila definitely wasn't kind of hanging out the window and shouting demands or anything. There was nothing. Apparently while Jeremy was waiting outside with the officers he seemed very calm and collected which seemed very strange because his family was apparently under attack and he wasn't trying to break the door down. He spoke to another officer about Sheila a bit more and he called her a nutter. At the time the officers did question why Jeremy had called the police station rather than 999 which is our emergency number, the equivalent of 911, and they also wondered why Neville didn't do the same thing and so Jeremy's answer to the first question was that he wasn't sure how quickly the police would respond to his 999 call which personally I think is a load of rubbish. And to the second question, he said that Neville was trying to keep it within the family instead of getting the police involved and anyone getting arrested, which I can kind of see. I do think that if Neville wasn't actually fearing for his life and was trying to subdue see Sheila perhaps, he might not have wanted to involve the police so that she wouldn't get arrested and have her boys taken away from her. So that part I can kind of see, but it still doesn't make sense that Jeremy phoned the police station instead of 999 to me. Finally, at 7.54am, the police officers finally broke into the house because I guess they realised that they weren't going to be able to contact Sheila. Inside, they found five people dead. Neville Bamber's body was downstairs in the kitchen. He was the only one who actually made it downstairs and it looked like he had been involved in some kind of struggle. He had been shot six times in the face 
and twice elsewhere. The police said that he was likely shot upstairs first and then made his way downstairs and engaged with the killer there. What's interesting is that the pathologist on the case confirmed that Neville wouldn't have been able to speak and therefore he probably wouldn't have been able to make that phone call to Jeremy because of where he'd been shot. The twin boys, Daniel and Nicholas, were found shot in their beds. They had both been shot multiple times at close range. And then Sheila and June were both found in the master bedroom. June had been shot multiple times and was found on the floor and Sheila had been shot twice. Initially, the police had this down as a murder-suicide. I guess they took Jeremy's word for it. They thought, like Jeremy had suggested, Sheila had lost it and killed her entire family before turning the gun on herself. Because it seemed like such a simple case, it's kind of open and shut in their eyes. They had the murderer there and she was dead. They didn't treat the crime scene properly or as evidence like they should have and so they let Jeremy and his extended family back into the farm just three days after the murders. I guess the family had been kind of looking around, cleaning up and sorting through some things. A family member, I'm not sure who, found a silencer in the downstairs cupboard. They handed it into the police later and the police found that this was covered in blood, indicating that it had been used. A week or so later, on the 16th of August, the funeral was held for the whole family. According to other attendees, Jeremy Bamber's behaviour was a little off. Some people have suggested that he had crocodile tears and later on at the wake, Jeremy was also seen laughing and joking around. That by itself isn't necessarily the strangest thing. I've been to wakes after funerals and it's kind of where everyone sort of lets loose and talks about the dead family member or members and kind of remembers them and celebrates their life, except it is a little strange considering that the whole family had been murdered and two children were also dead. I feel like a wake after that incident might have been a little bit different to the ways that I've been to. Shortly after the funeral, Jeremy went off to Amsterdam for a holiday. I don't know if this was drug related or not, like the Australian New Zealand stuff. And after he returned to the UK, he started selling off his family's belongings. He also attempted to sell nude photos of Sheila to the press. Everything started coming together a month later on the 7th of September because Jeremy's girlfriend of two years, whose name was Julie, changed her initial statement to say that Jeremy had been planning to kill his entire family. This obviously threw a massive spanner in the works. The police had closed the case. They thought they had the killer. They thought she had killed herself and that was it. And this was especially confounding because previously, Julie had been completely supportive of Jeremy. So why was she coming forward now, you may ask? It seems as though Julie and Jeremy were going through relationship issues, and it seems as though Julie decided to change her story after Jeremy had either broken up with her or threatened to break up with her. Julie spoke to the police and told them that up to a year prior, Jeremy had spoken to her about possibly killing his family. He apparently said he wanted to get rid of them, and he allegedly spoke about different ways of doing so. On top of all of that, he had apparently told Julie that Sheila would make a good scapegoat. So Julie was able to add a little bit more information on what happened on the morning of the 7th of August. Apparently he phoned Julie up and said that it had to be tonight or never. This was around 9.50 so if the farm workers account of Jeremy leaving the house at 9.30 was true, Jeremy would have already left, possibly after having an argument with his family. Apparently Jeremy called Julie again at 3.30 in the morning to tell her that everything was going well and after receiving news from elsewhere about the murders in the farm, Julie headed over there and spoke to Jeremy me and he allegedly told her that he should have been an actor. Apparently Julie asked Jeremy if he was behind all of this and I mean if these other statements are true from her then I guess it's kind of obvious, I don't know why she felt the need to ask him, but apparently Jeremy told her that he had paid to have someone kill the family. On the 8th of September Jeremy was arrested and he kept insisting that he was innocent and that Julie was making all of this up because she was upset that they were going to break up. He was later released on bail for some reason, after which he went on another holiday abroad. He returned on the 29th of September and he was arrested again, I think for breaching his bail, but don't quote me on that, and he was charged with murdering his family. The trial took place in October of 1986, a year and a bit after the murders. The prosecutors suggested that Jeremy returned to the family home on the early hours of 7th of August and he entered the house through a downstairs window. They said he took the rifle with the silencer on and shot June first and then he went on to kill Neville, Sheila and the two boys. They argued that Jeremy then removed the silencer and put it away to make it look as though Sheila had committed the crimes and then killed herself. This silencer was a massive deal in terms of evidence. The investigators found that it had definitely been on the rifle when it was shot but was somehow put away in a cupboard afterwards. The prosecutors suggested that if Sheila had been the one behind the murders, she wouldn't have gone through the trouble of taking the silencer off, putting it downstairs in a cupboard, coming back upstairs and then killing herself. Sheila also didn't have any lead residue or blood on or around her fingernails and that definitely would have happened if she was shooting the rifle. And so ultimately Jeremy Bamble was found guilty of 
all five murders and was given a whole life sentence and that's a massive deal here in the UK. I think there are less than 100 prisoners who have received that sentence and I think it shows just how awful these crimes were. To this day, Jeremy Bamber remains in prison and he continues to say that he's not guilty. He has been appealing his whole life sentence ever since he was convicted and there are a lot of people who think that he is innocent and he seems to have built himself quite the fan club. I think that due to the botched investigation, there's always going to be some doubts in people's minds over whether or not Jeremy did it because proper procedures just weren't followed and so it allows for an element of doubt, I think. Personally, I believe that he did do it, as going by the evidence that was collected and Jeremy's behaviour surrounding the incident, it makes the most sense to me. It makes sense that perhaps Jeremy wanted to kill his entire family in order to inherit the entire farm estate and become a very, very rich man. It of course doesn't help that the police took hours to enter the house on the 7th of August in the first place, and they didn't immediately close off the crime scene or search it thoroughly. Letting the, letting the extended family and Jeremy in just three days after the murders was not a good decision and it was definitely a mistake and it is also said that the police burnt some of the evidence to get rid of it so that Jeremy didn't have to look at it. So all of that seems dodge. I don't want to accuse the police of anything in this video because I don't want my house raided but the investigation itself was dodgy and so I don't think anyone's ever going to get a clear idea of what exactly happened that night and I think there's always going to be doubt in people's minds as to whether Jeremy was guilty but personally I think he is. So that was the case, now we're going to talk about the book and my review. So this is the book. I honestly thought that this was fantastic. I read parts of it and I listened to other parts on audio, but I would recommend if you're interested in reading about this case, first of all, picking up this book would be a good start. But if you're able to perhaps get your hands on a physical copy because there are photos. And I always appreciate it when there are photos in my non-fiction books because it adds some context to what they are trying to teach you. I think that this case was presented really, really well in this book. I gave this book four stars because I think, like I said, it was presented really well. There are photos in there. It also started right at the beginning, so it didn't start off with with the incident with the murders on the 7th of August. It starts off by talking about the Bamba family background and even some background on White House Farm before it was given or bought by the Bambas. So there's a lot of good information there. And it also talks a lot about the Bamba children's childhoods, which I found very interesting. It kind of gives you an idea of why Sheila and Jeremy grew up to be that way. I didn't go into it too much in this video because I wanted to get onto the actual incident. But if you want some background on the Bamba family, I would definitely recommend picking this book up. As for it describing the actual case, I think it just covers what most other sources I could find covered. There wasn't anything really new there. I think the author may have spoken to extended family members and... Colin as well, the father of the twin boys, because she included some quotes there. And that was actually very helpful as well for getting an idea of how people surrounding the case were feeling at the time and what police had perhaps left out of their investigation, because obviously <laughs> The police could not be trusted with this case. I did watch an episode of the show and I found it quite interesting. I'll probably watch the rest of it because I am quite interested in this case, but I don't think it's going to add anything new that this book wouldn't tell you. So if you want a detailed account of this case and everything leading up to it, I would definitely recommend buying this book. I think that the author manages to cover quite a complex case, I feel, very, very well and it's easy reading. I didn't find it too difficult to read at all in terms of writing style. The murders themselves were a bit uh, grim to read about to say the least and it also introduced me to something I've not really heard spoken about so I obviously live in the UK I live in the south so not too far away from Essex and I've never heard of this case before now which is unusual because serial killings or murders in general don't happen as often here in the UK as they do in other countries I'm thinking of the US in particular so they do tend to be all over the news and even if they happened decades ago I would have expected my grandparents or my parents to actually talk about this case it must have been all over the news for them as well but I've never heard anyone talk about it in my life which is very unusual so I'm really glad that I picked up this book I am definitely going to be keeping an eye on this case in the future I'll be very interested to know whether or not Jeremy Bamba ever gets let out of prison I think that could be a mistake but at the same time I'm not the jurors nor am I the judge which may be for the best. So thank you so much for watching this video I hope you enjoyed it I hope I was clear in presenting the information this is only the second true crime video that I've done so it may have been a little bit dodgy but I really enjoyed researching this one and I enjoyed the book that I read so that always helps. Let me know in the comments below if you think Jeremy Bamber is guilty or innocent I would love to know your reasons why. I'll be back soonish I hope with another true crime case please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and I'll speak to you all in the next one. Bye!